Council uh, was hosted a think tank roundtable at Singapore International Energy Week last year. Um, we were uh, very happy to do that again this year and just wish we were uh, in Singapore in person. Uh, but unfortunately, that is the situation we're in right now. Um, as you all know, with the US presidential election on Tuesday and COVID-19 shutting down major economies yet again, the decisions, uh, decision Americans will make next week will have consequences far beyond the US's borders. The two candidates are presenting starkly different visions for the future of US energy policy. The Democratic nominee, Joe Biden, has announced a climate plan that would see an unprecedented amount of spending on green infrastructure and place significant pressure on the US oil and gas industry to tackle emissions. On the other hand, a second Trump administration would likely continue to pursue the so-called energy dominance agenda of the past four years, which would include support for the oil and gas industry, which has been suffering greatly throughout the pandemic due to the global downturn in oil, oil demand. So to discuss these options and more, it is my pleasure to introduce some of the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center's best for a series of presentations and Q&A. So first we have David Goldman, uh, Go sorry, David Goldman, chairman of the Atlantic Council Energy Advisory Group and Andrea Claybaugh, associate at Goldwyn Global Strategies. And they'll give an overview of the possible presidential and electoral per permutations that might shape US energy policy for the next four years. They are co-authors of the recent Atlantic Council report, Election 2020, What's It Say for Energy? Which I would encourage you all to read. And I believe that is uh, that you can get a link to that report in the app. Um, after that, we'll hear from Global Energy Center Senior Fellow John Morton, who will present on Global Pathways for Energy and Climate Action. And finally, uh, we'll hear from Global Energy Center Deputy Director for Climate and Advanced Energy, Maggie Jackson, and she will discuss uh, how all of these changes are shaping geopolitics and the geopolitics of climate leadership as the world moves through and past the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, I will be interjecting questions uh, throughout these presentations, um, as well as introducing questions from the audience. So please feel free to input your questions using the uh, CU app. Um, and I'll, I have that right next to me and I'll be uh, pulling those up. Um, and once all the presentations are finished, uh, we can reconvene all the speakers for a group Q&A. So with that, I'd like to welcome our first two presenters, David Goldwyn and Andrea Claybaugh. Thanks, Randy, and greetings uh, to everyone. A pleasure to be here and with such distinguished panelists. Uh, as Randy noted, this will be a consequential election for energy and climate, not just in the United States, but perhaps for the world. Uh, President Biden and President Trump are pretty much polar opposites on climate and to a large extent on energy as well. And at stake here is whether the US will be a leader or a laggard on climate policy and whether it will support and invest in or resist and contest the scientific consensus and the scientific community. The world has changed also because of COVID. And in the United States, the idea of spending a trillion or $2 trillion in infrastructure, which was unthinkable five or six years ago for budgetary reasons, is now very thinkable. And so those options are, are quite significant. And climate itself is, uh, is now a top line agenda, one of the four crises the Vice President Biden says that he will address. So if President Trump is reelected, we are likely to see, as Randy suggested, more energy dominance, uh, more deregulation, and more disavowal of climate considerations, particularly in the permitting of infrastructure. I say likely because there's a large random element with President Trump and not facing re-election. You never know what he, he will do, but this has been core to his presidency so far. Most of what he has tried to do has been contested in the courts, whether or not agencies can regulate carbon, whether they can regulate climate without very specific mandates from Congress. And now with a 6-3 majority in the Supreme Court, it is very likely that he would prevail on a significant number of those, of those, those, those court cases. But it means there will be no EPA regulation of methane in the United States if the president is, is reelected. There will be headwinds for offshore wind, um, which he seems to think hurts birds. And at home, there will be no cumulative or direct or indirect assessment of the climate impacts of infrastructure. There'll be an assertion of federal supremacy. So California's attempt to phase out internal combustion engines or to have zero emission vehicles will be contested in the courts. And that outcome is uncertain. Abroad, the president we, the United States will be out of the Paris Agreement. And that may lead to fragmentation in the pace of the energy transition. We're likely to see more tariffs uh, on Europe and a much more uh, 
contested relationship with China, which the administration has labeled the United States number one adversary. That means challenges to others as to whether they use Chinese technology or non-Chinese technology and, and extremely strong limits on Chinese investment, if in fact a ban in the United States. We assume that if the president wins re-election, he also wins the Senate, which means there are no guardrails, no accountability on the president's actions. Um, and, uh, and while there are some Republicans who believe in climate change and are expressing some support, none of them are in the congressional party uh, in the Congress. So we might see some common cause on investment in carbon capture and maybe some R&D spending, but under a Trump presidency, that would really be the limits of, of spending on climate. Um, but I would say beware of the backlash. In our system, the states have enormous power. States can set their own clean energy standards, renewable portfolio standards. So there will be significant growth in renewable energy in the United States. States can say no on infrastructure. It will be much more challenging to have cross-border pipelines. And companies will be under enormous pressure by their employees and their investors to decarbonize and to green their operations. In fact, the big, the big takeaway under a Trump presidency is a huge focus on business. What will you do? Where will you stand? And what will your employees tolerate? I think we're also likely to see some civic backlash on energy. And in fact, if the election itself is contested, civic backlash if, if they believe either that the election is manipulated or that the administration is not taking action on racial justice. So uh, overall, we're looking at a period of high volatility coming from the United States if the president is, is reelected including, I would say, a weak economic revival as herd immunity becomes the U.S. policy on combating the coronavirus. Uh, this is a very different picture um, if, uh, if the vice president is elected. And let me turn to my co-author, Andrea Claybone, for that discussion. All right, well, good morning. Um, and thank you, uh, David, for that really excellent scene setter. And um, I just want to reiterate, um, to your last comment, uh, that we were really are really living in a whole new world because of the coronavirus that has obviously had some really significant implications uh, for the president, but it has major implications for the former vice president as well if he is elected and how he can and how he ultimately will govern. So the key and most significant issue for the former vice president is what Congress will he be facing in 2021? Does he have control of the Congress, meaning a sweep scenario where his party controls both the Senate and the House of Representatives, or is he facing a split scenario, basically what we see today with Democrats in control of the House and Republicans remaining in control of the Senate? Um, in both scenarios, though, it really should be emphasized that there are going to be some significant limitations to what Biden is going to be able to do to actually execute his energy and climate vision as he has expressed it. We saw throughout this summer, there was a real effort among progressive Democrats to push the former vice president a little further left on his energy and climate platform. We did see, for example, the new commitment uh, to carbon pollution free power by 2035. But it should be noted that the Biden team has been very disciplined and very focused in how it has approached energy throughout the campaign. So what does that mean in terms of what we might be looking at in 2021? Well, I want to start with the split scenario where the president or President Biden would not have control of the Congress. In this scenario, the vast majority of his plans will need to be achieved through the regulatory process at the U.S. federal agencies. Um, any legislative prospects are very tight and very confined by what a Senate uh, would be willing to go for, which is controlled by the GOP. Uh, we do know that Biden will want to re-enter the Paris Agreement, and to do that, he will need an expanded U.S. nationally determined contribution commitment. He may try to support that with a new clean electricity and energy standard, which he has said he would like to do, um, possibly via uh, the statutory authorities of the Clean Air Act. Uh, but again, he will have to do that through a lengthy regulatory process. And it's not necessarily ironclad, particularly if that were to be challenged in the courts. He will also want to regulate methane and other pollutants, and he will certainly try to seek a majority at FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, which could have significant implications for power generation in the United States and adjacent infrastructure such as natural gas pipelines. But again, anything done via the regulatory process could theoretically be challenged, and now it seems like it would be facing a 6-3 conservative Supreme Court. So let's talk then 
talking a bit about the sweep scenario where he would have control of both chambers of Congress under the Democratic Party. Even here, there are going to be some limitations, even if they do want to pass a major package which would have significant climate components. So with a simple majority in the Senate, they theoretically could use the budget reconciliation process to pass a major spending bill. This could rewrite the tax code, perhaps expand incentives and supports for renewable energy infrastructure. Um, but if you're thinking about transformative legislation, um, in that case, there may need to be a discussion about ending the filibuster in order to get the votes you need uh, to actually pass that through the Congress, because it seems very difficult to imagine a highly controversial package getting you to uh, a 60 vote threshold in the Senate. That said, anything done via the legislative process is considerably more difficult to undo by a future administration. I'll close with a brief word on trade and foreign policy under a Biden administration. We do know that Biden is very much interested in resetting U.S. foreign policy to something akin to the Obama era status quo. But in reality, that's going to be very difficult to do. And I'll give just a few examples. Uh, we know that Biden wants a new deal with Iran. Um, but Iran has been tragically ravaged by the coronavirus and its economy has been very deeply damaged by the impact of U.S. sanctions over the last couple of years. So getting to a new JCPOA is probably going to be a very time consuming and challenging process, which also carries domestic political risks here in the United States as well. China is another great example. Uh, we know China would be a critical partner on managing climate change, but there are a number of very real nas US national security issues with respect to uh, what China is doing overseas, particularly in the South China Seas and other regions. There's also the question of, would the trade war persist in all but name? Um, another example is Russia. Uh, we know that the former vice president takes a very dim view of uh, uh, Vladimir Putin. Um, and we know that um, he would probably have a much stronger position on Russian adventurism, particularly in Eastern Europe. Um, we can expect that that relationship to become much more adversarial quite quickly. And I'll close briefly on trade, which is an area where we feel that there are a number of very significant open questions still to be addressed. The former vice president has been very vocal on buy American and made in America. So it is not clear that he will necessarily want to rush into a new major multilateral trade agreement. In that scenario, protectionism, as we have seen under Trump, may not necessarily disappear, but it could evolve into some new form. Um, so with that, um, I'll close and um, hand the mic back to Randy. Thank you, David and Andrea. I'm gonna ask uh, two questions um, about uh, sort of the tr Trump scenario and a Biden scenario. Um, so first in a Biden scenario, uh, one of the things that, that Trump has done on energy policy is, um, uh, made the U.S. Um, significantly more relevant in OPEC. Um, he is never in the room, but always in the room, whether he's tweeting or just um, just uh, sort of in the back of his mind, you know, sort of in the background lurking or making sometimes uh, even making phone calls. Um, in a Biden presidency, how do you see Biden um, playing a role in OPEC, if any, um, or, or how will that relationship evolve over, over the next four years if Biden is president? Let me take the first run at that one. I think American presidents are always focused on the oil market and what uh, OPEC is doing. The largest worries for are very sudden, very rapid increases in oil prices, which provide a shock to the economy and, and don't give time for the American consumer to adjust. I do not see it likely that, uh, a, uh, that a President Biden would be intervening with OPEC or trying to take action when oil prices are low in order to elevate them uh, to, you know, to higher levels as we saw um, President Trump do. So I think that's not on. I think in the event we were a scenario where we had an oil supply disruption, which provided a shock to the economy, as, you know, as former presidents have done, they would look to, um, to countries to release spare capacity if they had it. So that kind of diplomacy would, would continue um, and they would look to using strategic reserves if necessary in order to provide short-term amelioration of the, of the shock. But um, the, the virtual seat at the table uh, at OPEC that uh, President Trump has, I, I just don't see that happening um, with President Biden. 
yeah, I agree with all that. Okay, question number two, and, and, and those out in the audience, of course, feel free to ask questions as well through the app. Um, question number two, Trump, Trump presidency, Trump 2.0. Um, you've seen in uh, over the past month, China make an ambitious announcement uh, to get to net zero by 2060. Just this week, Japan uh, made a very ambitious announcement to get to net zero by 2050. Uh, the EU, of course, has been driving a conversation about green stimulus and climate action uh, for, for much of the year. Um, in a Trump 2.0 administration, does the US get left behind on uh, all the new technologies that ultimately will be the future of the energy system? And what does that mean for Trump's energy dominance agenda, if that is the case? What a great, great question, uh, Randy. Um, uh, I thought you were going to ask whether or not uh, President Trump might want to have his own uh, mid-century target too, but <laughs> clearly that, that won't happen. That, I mean, David, you suggested that you know anything is possible in the Trump administration. In the Trump administration, I, I and I, I concur. Anything is possible. That seems highly unlikely. Yeah, I agree with that. Um, you know, it's a it's a more complicated question about whether we get left behind on the technologies because there are certainly uh, American entrepreneurs, you know, who see there is a global market for these technologies. And we'll have John Morton on later on, I think, who's you know, you know, front center in, uh, in, in this conversation. So I don't think that, um, that uh, US companies are gonna take themselves out of that, that competition, but the US market will be, will be different. Um, I guess the question will be for influence and geopolitical influence more than anything else, will the US get left behind? And there, I think, under a President Trump who might pull out of NATO, who is going to say my way or the highway on, on technology that's going to have tariffs on our major trading partners, that is ceding the geopolitical stage to a large extent to other actors who are willing to fill it, China among them. So I don't know if we're going to get left out of the technology race, but in terms of global influence, I am really worried on a couple of fronts. One is that we cede uh, sort of technological leadership to China, at least in, uh, in sort of whose technology goes first. The second is whether or not we encourage adventurism by others because the US is less of a geopolitical presence. And that, you know, Russia and its near abroad, China and the South China Sea, and with Taiwan and with Hong Kong, uh, even further than what we've seen before. Um, and even, even the kind of adventurism, or I would say, um, you know, sort of uh, authoritarianism that we've seen from Jair Bolsonaro in, in Brazil, that can create disharmony and disruption. Um, and it can be bad for the global economy. And I think that can be a headwind for, for technology. And with the U.S. not at the table uh, at the Conference of the Parties really anymore, out of the Paris Agreement, I think that's going to be slower for the energy transition, and that hurts demand. But, uh, but I don't know that, um, that in terms of competition for technology that the U.S. is out of it. I think companies will find their markets overseas. Got it. Um, Andrea? Yeah, so um, I concur with all of those points. And I would just add, uh, David mentioned earlier that the states um, in our federal system have a considerable amount of leeway and authority. Um, so also to municipalities and cities. And I would um, add the point that a number of states and uh, major cities in the United States are very much moving forward, um, really aggressively thinking about how to integrate new and emerging technologies into their plans to go either net zero or potentially further. Uh, California, for example, I believe is currently the fifth largest economy in the world uh, by on its own. Um, so there's you know potentially really fertile ground there to see some really significant developments and leaps forward. So even if the direction is not necessarily coming from the federal government to be a fast mover on the technological front, I don't think that necessarily means that the United States as a whole is out of the game because there is a great deal happening at the sub-federal level still. Got it. Thank you, uh, David and, and Andrea. You know, I'd love to go to John now. And actually, maybe, John, you could answer this question as well before you go into your presentation. I suspect you're going to get into it a little bit in your presentation, but maybe maybe just touch on what uh, what David and Andrea have said and then then get started with your talk. Uh, Randy, thanks. And it's actually a great jumping off point for, for, for the remarks that I was going to give. So I appreciate that seamless transition. Um, and I'll actually, I guess I will, while agreeing with David and Andrea on the notion that uh, American ingenuity and technology, you know, I think is, is, uh, is, is booming and will find a way to capitalize on this transition that we see. I guess I will make the point that there is a danger, and I think a fairly significant danger, to the US, if not being left behind, being 
uh, being uh, playing catch up for a while on uh, technologies, on standards, on protocols, on the underlying systems that will be integral to this transition to a lower carbon economy globally. And so I actually, I, I think that is a, um, that is a danger. It's, it's one that, uh, you know, I and many others have been, have been, have been raising. But the flip side of that is that there's a tremendous, I believe, and I think we're, we're seeing um, uh, borne out, tremendous um, economic upside to being, um, uh, to, to recognizing that the climate transition, um, but the transition to a low carbon economy um, is a is an economic opportunity that needs to be seized, and I and I'll I'll touch on some of those um, some of those points in my remarks right now. Um, so I'm happy to come back, Randy, if I didn't address fully what you what you were looking for there, uh, maybe after after my remarks. Um, but just just um, greetings, everyone. Good good morning, at least here from the U.S. Good evening to you, uh, um, or afternoon wherever you may be uh, in the world. Um, I'm John Morton. I'm a senior fellow at the uh, with, with the Atlantic Center. Um, Atlanta Council Global Energy Center, and um, uh, I'm a partner at Pollination, which is a global investment and advisory firm focused on climate transition. Um, in my former life, I was a, an advisor to President Obama working on climate and energy is issues in the White House. Um, and I, I guess I would, I would start with a fairly, you know, uh, maybe provocative statement, which um, to ground this conversation about the, 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 the global transition that um, I believe we all see underway now um, by saying that this transition to a, a global low carbon economy uh, represents at once the most predictable and on the other hand, the most consequential uh, economic transformation in human history. Uh, it's, it sounds like a big statement and I believe it is. Uh, I believe it's backed up by truth and, and fact in this case. Um, over the coming decades, we're going to see, I think, tens of millions of jobs um, and trillions of dollars of wealth uh, be created uh, in, uh, in sectors and in industries as we transition to a cleaner, uh, more efficient, more productive and more sustainable economy. Um, and so I think if you, um, if you start with that uh, notion, um, the question therefore is not whether the transition will occur, but rather how fast, um, who will lead uh, and who will follow or be left behind. Um, and I think those are questions with huge economic consequences um, not just for companies uh, and industries, but for countries. And I think the, the conversation we ended with, with David and Andrea there, uh, Andrea there were, um, were, were touching on the, the potential economic implications uh, of, um, to, to, the, to the different leadership postures that the, that the next US administration may take. Um, you know, I think it's, if you step back and look, look in from, from outside, uh, you realize that now almost half of the world's population lives in countries that have announced uh, a date certain for banning the internal combustion engine. Um, since 2015, uh, new energy, new uh, annual energy installation capacity added each year to the global grid um, has been predominantly renewable energy. In the US, uh, despite Trump's um, um, uh, bluster and, uh, and, and love of fossil fuels and coal in particular, um, we continue to add about three quarters of our new energy installation capacity in renewables every year. Um, and that's occurring um, not because Trump is a environmentalist and trying to appease his, um, his, his, uh, his left wing base, but rather because it makes economic sense. And of course, um, the cost curves on the underlying technologies are continuing to plummet. Uh, and uh, as, as is the cost on battery technology, which to date has been an obstacle for renewable uh, deployment and now is, um, is, is getting to a point where um, it, is a, um, it, it essentially uh, can, can make renewable energy, um, uh, can solve renewable energy's intermittency problems at cost parity with, uh, with uh, low cost gas, for example. Um, 189 countries are still party to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and, and as Randy mentioned a moment ago, we have in the last uh, you know, two months, we have not just uh, the European Union, which was somewhat expected, but then China, then Japan, and then most recently, just a couple of days ago, Korea, all announcing to net zero uh, transition uh, uh, plans by mid-century. If the US were to do that, we would have three quarters of global GDP, over three quarters of global GDP, having committed to a um, to, a, to a net zero transition by mid-century. I think the direction of travel here is extremely clear and that has consequences for those who ignore that, those signals. 
And so I think the question that I think countries around the world have been have been grappling with, um, some with, in my mind, more uh, success and foresight than others, is what to do about that. What if you if you see the direction of travel, if you agree that we're moving in a, in a direction where um, where uh, uh, carbon is essentially becomes more of a liability, um, how do you get ahead of that? And I think one answer is. Um, in using the COVID stimulus and recovery acts that David alluded to, um, to look forward as opposed to shoring up the status quo uh, industrial base that you have today. And I'll, I'll say a word about that in a moment. We've seen, I think, some countries and regions doing that much better, uh, met better than others. Um, the reason why this is important is because decisions you make, we make today um, will have uh, an enduring impact and, uh, on investment and shape infrastructure and industries for decades to come. Um, investments today in more climate resilient uh, infrastructure and industries are not only prudent to minimize future costs, but because they'll generate outsized returns as well. Um, some of the recent analysis from the International Renewable Energy Agency or IRENA um, shows that investments that expedite moving to a low carbon economy would increase global GDP by nearly $100 trillion by 2050. Um, and on the flip side of that, we know that the cost of inaction is staggering. And we see that uh, increasingly every, every year, every month, every week, seemingly here in the US in the, in the cost of um, the rising cost of climate related uh, natural uh, disasters or natural uh, incidences. Um, the, IPPC, uh, the IPCC calculates the failure to keep a temperature rise below two degrees could cost the global economy uh, $750 trillion uh, by the end of the century. Think about that, that's over $10 trillion a year in costs uh, for the next 80, uh, uh, $10 trillion a year in costs every year for the next 80 years. So I think as individuals, we often, we often understand and, and, and read these figures and think we understand them. But I think as, a, as generally as, as societies, we haven't yet responded to the gravity of the challenge, um, nor have we embraced, I think, yet fully the um, unprecedented scope of the, of the economic um, opportunity. And I think that's, as I said before, beginning to change. And, and one way we see that beginning to change um, is, in, uh, is in how countries uh, and institutions and corporations are, um, are accounting for carbon. I think this will be a, 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 um, an, an area to watch with great uh, interest uh, over, the coming, uh, over the coming couple of years as financial markets in particular begin to uh, report on, disclose, and account for carbon in their portfolios. You know, already today, um, the World Bank uh, reports that there's about 60 carbon pricing initiatives at either the national or subnational level that are in place or scheduled for implementation over the coming two years. Um, and jurisdictions covered under those programs account for almost already a quarter of global uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, over 2000 companies are using carbon accounting internally as a means of cleaning up their um, emissions and their value change and their supply chains. Um, and I don't think any of us on this call would expect those numbers to decrease over the years ahead. In other words, I think we're gonna see more and more um, uh, companies, countries, regions, et cetera, uh, thinking about how to price carbon in one way, shape, or form. I mentioned financial institutions a moment ago. Um, I think uh, financial institutions are very tuned in to the risk of carbon and, uh, and, and it, it's a drag on their long-term uh, uh, prospects. Um, you may have seen in January, C uh, BlackRock CEO Larry Fink wrote in his annual letter to CEOs BlackRock, of course, being the world's largest asset manager, controlling about $7 trillion in assets. Um, he wrote, quote, we are on the edge of a, fu uh, of a fundamental reshaping of finance. Uh, investors are recognizing that climate risk is investment risk. Uh, and he wrote later, in the near future and sooner than most anticipate, there will be a significant reallocation of capital. Um, Donald Trump's own uh, Commodities Future Trading Commission uh, which oversees our financial institutions in the U.S., uh, uh, wrote somewhat expectedly, but but in a discordant way, given the um, given the uh, leadership from the federal government, uh, uh, wrote climate change. This is just a month ago in a big report they put out. Climate change poses a major risk to the 
ability of the U.S. financial system and to its ability to sustain the American economy. Um, and that to uh, efficiently manage climate risk, we will need to see, we will need to facilitate the flow of capital to help accelerate the net zero transition and increase economic opportunity. So I think we have a rising uh, 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 and rapidly growing awareness um, within um, the financial market community that will be probably the um, one of the single biggest drivers of, uh, of action on, uh, on, on uh, global climate change in the years ahead as financial markets begin to price carbon and climate risk into their asset allocation decisions. Um, and that will be a seismic change in the way that, um, that, uh, that, that capital is allocated. And it will begin to impose uh, costs on carbon that are currently completely unpriced in, the, uh, in, in global financial markets. And so uh, maybe I'll just, I'll, I'll, I'll conclude with a couple thoughts on what, what I think we should, we should do. We should do as a, as, as a US uh, um, uh, economy and as a, as, as a country, um, informed by what some of uh, other countries have recently done with their own stimulus uh, efforts. So if you look around the world at who has been most progressive and forward leaning about using the COVID crisis to reinvest uh, capital in, um, uh, in a forward leaning, way that is consistent with the direction of travel toward a lower carbon uh, a global economy. I think you have to look at the European Union as, as perhaps the leader. Um, uh, they've announced a, a $900 billion next generation EU program. Nearly 40% of the funds in that program are allocated directly to objectives of the European uh, Green New Deal. And, um, and highlights uh, include being at zero by 2050, uh, increasing their emissions re reductions targets from 40% to 50% over 1990 levels uh, by 2030, uh, becoming climate neutral by 2050, um, raising over uh, $830 billion through green bonds, and then importantly, a, um, a very, very um, clear and, and um, directed prioritization of investment towards sectors that they see as, um, as consistent with this future direction of travel. Hydrogen, energy efficiency, building efficiency, electric charging points for vehicles. Um, and the last thing they've done, which I think is worth us all thinking about and noting, and certainly I think people in our Congress are looking at this carefully, is the intention, Europe's intention to design a, what they call a WTO compatible carbon border adjustment mechanism. And I'll close with this. We are in a global economy uh, it is impossible for the U.S. to act alone. Uh, assuming Trump wins and does little or nothing new on climate change, the rest of the world has indicated it is moving forward. And if you think about what a carbon border adjustment mechanism is, for those of you who, who are unfamiliar with the concept, it essentially imposes a tax um, on uh, or a border adjustment on high intensity uh, carbon products that are being traded into a another, another uh, trading partner or another trading block. And so the moment isn't far off where carbon intensive products from the US uh, will be explicitly taxed or tariffed in order to enter the European Union. And so there's an example of where we can pretend that we're doing fine and there's no, there's no large issue with climate change if, if, you know, if Trump is reelected and continues the status quo policies, but our products, our services, um, uh, if they are high, higher carbon intensity will be uh, will be treated accordingly um, at, at the border as, we end, as they try to enter the European Union. So um, I, I think that the, there's a tremendous opportunity now. I think Andrea hit on a lot of the things that Biden will do uh, if he is elected. He has a very forward-leaning plan on, on, these, on these matters. I think sees things in very much the way that I, I just laid out. Um, my fear, of course, with the Trump presidency when it comes to climate change is not simply the continued damage that would occur to the global economy with a continuation of his status quo uh, policies, but the real economic, long-term economic damage that could be posed to the US economy if we don't seize this moment of challenge and turn it into the economic opportunity that I believe it presents uh, for American industry and global industries more generally. So I'll stop there, Randy. Thanks for the opportunity to speak and I look forward to any questions you may have. John, thank you so much. Um, I have a whole bunch of questions. Um, I wanna start with carbon border adjustments since that's where you ended. Um, 
and and a couple of questions there. So so first, the Europeans are really are thinking about their carbon border adjustment um, tied to the ETS, um, which essentially would require, um, in, in, at least in some formulations of it, the any country to have some sort of carbon price in order to be exempt from uh, the border adjustment uh, for for goods being traded, even in a Biden administration with uh, a, a, a Democratic Senate. I don't see it possible that the U.S. has a carbon price. So how does that look when you have a, a U.S. that's that's working on climate and, and being progressive on climate, um, but can't can't produce that level of policy in order to be compliant with the EU? Does that create a some sort some sort of uh, green trade war between the U.S. and the EU, even if they don't necessarily want it? Um, or, or you know, what does that look like? Yeah, so I spent, I spent, as you know, Randy, I spent seven years um, in 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 the Obama administration working on climate climate policy and climate diplomacy, and spent a lot of time with the Europeans, spent a lot of time with the Chinese, spent a lot of time with the Indians, spent a lot of time around the world um, having having these very conversations. I think the 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 important thing, and this is going to sound like a bit of a punt to your question, but if the U.S. comes back to the table, the infamous table, and sits down as a partner in climate conversations and climate diplomacy and makes it clear that it is moving, we are moving in a way that is consistent with um, uh, strong efforts to uh, re-engage and commit our country to, uh, to progressive, aggressive action on climate change, there will be a way to negotiate these issues, right? There's no one size solution. There's no, there's no, so there's no easy answer to your question, except that there will not be a trade war if it's clear that the U.S. is, is re-engaging in a meaningful way on climate action, which I think Biden has made it clear he will, and certainly a Democratic, you know, Congress would 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 support. Yeah. yeah got it. So, it, it, do you think that there would be a a, a green trade war uh, in a Trump administration, led um, led by your? I, I think there certainly could be, and we've we've seen. We've, maybe we've seen um, sparks uh, in that war recently with uh, some decisions by uh, you know, large French companies not to invest into certain you know, large US uh, oh, companies be because of their efforts to, uh, because of their, the, the US companies lack of efforts on, uh, on methane emissions reductions, for example. I think we're seeing, we're beginning to see that there is a bit of a backbone to the European posture on climate change, which is in fact, which is affecting investment decisions already today. And again, think about direction of travel, that backbone is not going to get less stiff over the coming 10 years, it's going to significantly stiffen. And so that's already a beginning of I think what we might expect if the US is not a credible presence in global climate uh, conversations. Got it. I want to ask two more questions before we go to Maggie. Um, so one more on border carbon adjustment, uh, which a carbon border adjustment, which is um, uh, how do you think about the developing world with a, a carbon border adjustment mechanism? Um, doesn't uh, essentially punish uh, developing countries uh, that are still trying to get their economies going, but, but are reliant on fossil fuels and probably aren't going to be doing the big big spend right now to uh, to green green their infrastructure, et cetera? I think uh, you know, a one-size-fits-all uh, uh, program applied indiscriminately uh, would do what you just said, would, would, be, would be discriminatory uh, and would, would affect smaller and, and less well-off countries. And I think, I think the history of, um, of, of these types of, 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 of tariffs and structures um, you know, suggests that we can find ways of applying them um, to the you know more, more in a more targeted fashion to the to the countries that have the wherewithal to um, you know to adjust their behavior, but for various reasons are choosing not to. So look, it's not a it's not it, this is not a scenario that I that I that I look forward to and think, yay, we're going to have you know um, all these kind of uh, crazy tit for tat um, you know tr trade wars on based on carbon. But I do think it's coming, and I think the way to avoid it, right, the way to avoid it is for there to be um, three quarters of the world. Uh, or more, um, you know, having committed to a net zero economy, uh, net zero transition by mid-century, which happens if the U.S. joins, um, and then you have everyone kind of pulling in the same direction. So a carbon border adjustment mechanism is, is a is a patch for a larger problem. Um, it is not necessary if you have industries moving 
um, you know, steadily and in, 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 in a good direction with respect to carbon. I really like that that analogy. This it's a patch for a larger problem. That actually that, that I think really helps clarify how to think about it. Okay, final question. Um, this goes back to your OPIC days. For those of you who don't know, John uh, used to be the COO at OPIC, which is now the uh, USDFC Development Finance Corporation. It's changed its name. Um, in a potential Biden administration, uh, how do you see the DFC uh, operating? And I want to ask on two specific questions where there's been a change. Uh, from previous policy. One on nuclear exports and supporting U.S. nuclear exports, and two uh, on uh, some of the efforts that the DSC has been making for uh, to support foreign uh, oil and gas infrastructure. What do you think Biden, how do you think Biden would continue either of those policies or cut cut those off? So it's a great, great question, Randy. Um, so I, uh, and they're both, they're, you know, they're, I'll try to be brief because those are, those are both super, super uh, in, uh, intense and, and long answers uh, could be could be given. Um, um, you know, look, DFC and OPIC before it is meant to be providing um, uh, U.S. Uh, capital and insurance to companies looking to expand or invest in overseas markets around the world. Um, it is uh, meant to be doing that in a way that returns money to the U.S. taxpayer, uh, but is developmentally oriented. Um, and it is meant to be crowding in as opposed to be crowding out the private sector. Right. So it's meant to be a catalyst for investment as opposed to um, stepping in where private markets would otherwise operate. Um, I, I think it is it, it, it is hard to it, ha, it historically has been hard to make the case that there is a clear commercial case um, and a, uh, a for uh, for for nuclear and oil and gas, the need for kind of government intervention on both of those uh, on both of those fronts. Um, uh, and that returns can be generated in the case of nuclear in the period of time uh, that, uh, that that OPIC tends to make its loans uh, for. Nuclear are usually very, very long-term investments, higher risk, higher regulation, right? Lots of, lots of, uh, lots of interests and pressures around them. That's why nuclear was originally excluded from, from OPIC's uh, um, mandate. So it'll be interesting to see what will happen. I don't expect Biden will change the ability of OPEC to, to do nuclear, but I think the question is how much real demand is there out there? And is it consistent with the types of products and services and return expectations that Congress has put on OPEC or DFC as, a, as an agency? Um, with respect to oil and gas, the question has always been, do you need public monies to support oil and gas investments? You know, Why is that necessary? Isn't that a sector that traditionally uh, is established and should be able to raise private capital to fund those investments. So I would ask that same question going forward. Um, the one area where I do think that there's real that th that there is real um, that there may be real interest in, and I'll just flag this for people who follow these issues. Um, one of the really interesting things I think in climate finance over the coming ten years will be not how do we use public money to develop more green energy more low carbon transportation, more green assets, et cetera. Of course, that will be a question. So that, I take that as given. But in order for us to get to these 2050 targets that the EU, that China, that Japan, that South Korea, and that the US will set if Biden is elected, we are going to have to take high emitting assets offline before the end of their, uh, of their natural life, right? That's not just coal assets, that's uh, um, high, you know, high emitting uh, manufacturing assets as well. We're gonna have to transition them. And I think there's an important role for public finance in thinking through how do we finance the closure of assets or the transitioning of assets. And that's a very different approach from what climate, what, what public finance has been used for historically, um, you know, over the last 20, 30, 40 years. Um, so I just flag that as a, as a place to watch because I think the European Union is looking at that. I think the US will need to look at that. And I think our partners around the world in Asia will need to look at that as well. John, I was going to ask you a question about stranded assets, and I didn't even have to. You answered it without me asking. Um, so thank you so much. Uh, we are starting to get some questions in the Q&A. Um, they're all actually very good for the group uh, as a whole, so I'm going to save those for the end. Um, but if you do have specific questions uh, during Maggie's presentation, feel free to ask them and I'll get to them during Maggie. Otherwise, we can, um, uh, we'll address what we have now in the Q&A uh, with the group at the end. So now I'd like to turn it to my colleague, uh, Maggie Jackson. 
Hi, everyone. Good morning from Washington, D.C., and good evening to our audience in Singapore and across Asia. It's a pleasure to be here today, and I look forward to talking about this topic of the geopolitical, the, the geopolitics of climate leadership, because there's been so many announcements uh, coming out of Asia over the last few months, as the previous panelists have alluded to. Um, they also talked about um, how, from a U.S. perspective, the U.S. election will determine the trajectory of the U.S. role in the fight against climate change. For the first time in our history, climate change has been a top issue in this presidential election, uh, with many voters ranking it second to health care. So this election outcome will shape U.S. domestic policy on energy and climate, and also shape the U.S. role in global climate leadership. And this is a place where the U.S. has been largely absent uh, since President Trump withdrew from this Paris Agreement after coming into office. Um, speaking of the Paris Agreement, 2020 marks the year when countries were supposed to increase climate ambition and update their nationally determined contributions. As we know, uh, the uh, climate negotiations have been pushed to next year uh, in the UK with COP26 um, due to the coronavirus. Um, but additionally, this year, uh, we've seen many examples of extreme weather and extreme heat caused by human-induced climate change. Um, and so the pressure from citizens on government to take greater action um, is really higher than ever before. And further, uh, the pandemic has taught us that we have little control over nature. We've witnessed the important role that big government must play to stop a pandemic from spreading around the world. And also what happens when, when countries uh, such as the US fail to cooperate on a multilateral level to solve the problem. So from my point of view, climate change action is not a choice. It's an imperative for countries around the world, uh, especially developed countries who are responsible for high historic emissions, um, and also for countries such as China and, and also India, uh, who are emerging as, as the highest uh, greenhouse gas uh, uh, emitters. Uh, are these countries that are also the world's largest economies are responsible for leading the transition away from fossil fuels, uh, but also for assisting developing countries with mitigation and adaptation. To me, cl climate change leadership requires uh, forward thinking domestic policy, expansion of renewable energy and clean energy resources domestically, and also a significant investment in technology innovation. But on an international level, it also includes an active role in clean energy investment overseas, and also in inter international negotiations at a multilateral level. Um, so based on these factors, Europe is the unquestionable leader, as we all know, in, in the fight against climate change. And this is demonstrated by uh, what John had talked about with the Green Deal, um, which Europe really sees as a way to shape the economic recovery from COVID and calls it a new growth uh, strategy. So Europe is poised to be the first climate uh, neutral continent uh, by the year 2050. And so the world is closely watching Europe's strategy. There's been a lot of questions about how they can actually achieve this ambitious target. Um, but it's clear that other countries are starting to follow uh, Europe's lead, um, and in particular China. Um, as, as we saw, President Xi addressed the United Nations in September and announced that China will be carbon neutral by 2060. I think this announcement took many people by surprise, including those uh, in China, because as we know, this path uh, towards decarbonization for China in such a short timeline um, is highly ambitious and will be very difficult, but there is uh, somewhat of a pathway that's been proposed by a number of scenarios from researchers uh, within China. Um, but China does rely on coal for almost 60% of its power generation, and coal will likely continue to be a part of China's uh, energy mix through 2050, and so it will highly uh, rely on uh, technologies such as carbon uh, capture and carbon removal technology. But I want to go into the geopolitical um, geopolitics of, of this action by President Xi, um, because it was a very strategic move. Um, he understands that climate change is going to influence international relations, um, and his announcement really gave him an opening to more closely align with Europe uh, as the U.S. has taken a step back uh, from climate action uh, under the pre uh, President Trump's administration. Um, interestingly enough, his uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs went as far as following up that statement by publishing a fact sheet on how the U.S. has slipped on environmental protection and, and climate policy, uh, which then prompted a response by our Secretary of State uh, Pompeo. The situation could not be more different than when we saw President Obama and President Xi announce a joint statement in 2014 um, on climate co cooperation in the lead up to Paris uh, in 2015. Um, I think that this announcement is very significant. It shows that China does not need to wait for the United States and rather is uh, ready to play a more leading role in international governments and, uh, the cl and climate governance.
Um, and if there's any question about whether uh, China is emerging as a leader uh, or if cl climate action is, is shaping geopolitics, I think the announcements that followed uh, do offer an answer. Uh, as, as mentioned before, uh, in this last week, both Japan and South Korea have also announced uh, carbon neutrality uh, by 2050. Um, Prime Minister Suga announced in his opening speech to the Diet on Monday morning uh, that that Japan will be climate neutral by 2050. And this is significant because Japan's, up until now, Japan has said that they will reach um, only an 80% emissions reduction by 2050. So this is a, a big improvement. He is certainly sending a signal to his domestic audience that Japan needs stronger support for revitalizing its nuclear fleet, uh, also accelerating deployment of solar and offshore wind, and then increased innovation in new decarbonization technologies. Um, until this announcement, I, I would say that where there was growing concern in Japan over the prospect of a new democratic administration in the US because of uh, Biden's strong position on climate change. If Biden won and Japan had not revised its target, it would have been one of the few developed countries advocating for a longer timeline for decarbonization. Um, so with pressure from the EU, China, and potentially from the US, uh, Japan also probably saw uh, the carbon neutrality target as a, as a smart geopolitical decision. Um, however, I don't want to discount that there's been a growing public uh, and private sentiment in Japan for more action on climate change, starting with pressure to increase um, ambition under their NDC and also to cease uh, overseas coal finance. Finally, I, I also want to mention, as John did, that uh, just on, on Wednesday, yesterday, President Moon announced that South Korea will also be carbon neutral, um, which is a follow-up uh, to the proposed uh, Green New Deal that his party had, had discussed during uh, the election. So each of these targets uh, is significant for, for these countries because they still rely heavily on coal for a large part. Uh, share of their power generation, um, but they are also some of the largest financiers of, of coal development overseas. They've received a lot of criticism for coal finance, but the argument has traditionally been that countries with developing economies require an affordable energy option, and coal so far has been uh, the only answer. And so I've been wondering with these announcements what that will mean for overseas investment uh, in fossil fuels, specifically coal. And we've seen some announcements out of Japan that this is changing. Um, and I'm also starting to be optimistic because it looks like that uh, potentially these announcements could be um, have a significant Im uh, impact on the push factor from these developed countries. But it's looking like there's also um, uh, some hope from the pull factor from countries such as Vietnam, Bangladesh, and the Philippines that have indicated they uh, are going to be moving from coal uh, to potentially LNG or more renewables, uh, depending on the on their um, individual context. Um, so we're hope I hope to see that the competition is less about uh, development of, of fossil generation and coal generation and more about uh, clean energy uh, market shares. Um, this is again important for uh, contexts like South Southeast Asia because the coal heavy expansion of power generation is expected to increase in the power sector's share of total emissions to about 50% in 2040, up from 42% today. So again, that's quite um, a lot of coal development. Um, again, as we talked about, uh, the need to push for net zero by 2050. Um, there, there needs to be more renewable energy investment, um, also increased energy efficiency initiatives, uh, improved standards and environment uh, and safety, and also policy support uh, for renewable energy. The US under the Trump administration has launched the free and open Indo-Pacific strategy and within this has, has also addressed a number of pillars um, in their strategy uh, towards the Indo-Pacific um, to include energy. That initiative is called Asia Enhancing Growth and Development Through Energy. Um, and in this program, the US government is working to build relationships across Asia uh, through energy infrastructure development. And so far, again, um, because of Trump's position on, on energy dominance and the role of US LNG as an export, um, that has been uh, where a lot of uh, the focus the focus is, and in partnership with with partners such as Japan um, and others uh, throughout the region. So I expect that if Trump wins, he would continue to develop this policy and work with allies uh, like Japan um, to build out uh, more LNG infrastructure and again uh, create 
uh, a better market. I, I'm also interested maybe to hear more from John on the role of DFC because they are playing a big role in this in terms of financing aspects. Um, if Biden wins, I expect that the same commitment uh, would, would be there for economic development and, and using ec economic development to build relationships uh, across this region. Um, but I would hope to see a stronger emphasis on renewable energy and also investment in transmission and, and distribution to facilitate um, higher uh, penetration of renewable energy. Um, but I think overall, you will likely see uh, a Biden administration, um, if he wins, integrate climate change into many different aspects of governments, uh, including foreign policy. Uh, this doesn't mean that he would necessarily deprioritize other areas of concern, such as, as China. Um, however, I think that his administration would be much uh, better at clearly defining areas of competition uh, versus cooperation. Um, but I want to echo what some of the other panelists have said, uh, but by saying that I'm confident that many US citizens, um, you know, mayors and governors at a, at a local level and, and US corporations are going to continue along the path uh, to net zero and, and more ambitious climate action, even if it's not happening at the federal level. However, I agree that US global influence will suffer uh, if we do not step up with a carbon neutrality target for 2050. Um, and I think other countries um, such as, as Brazil, as, as David mentioned, will also start to feel the negative impacts of this um, for, for many different reasons. Um, the carbon border adjustment, I mean, we can name it quite a few, um, but it's clear that climate is a central pillar um, of, of foreign relations and we're, we're seeing it um, coming up in, in every, across the multilateral forums from the G7 to the UN to international finance uh, institutions and this pressure to take action will not be going away. So I will stop there, Randy, and let you ask any questions, but uh, I look forward to continuing this conversation and hearing from the audience as well. Maggie, thank you so much. Um, really, really fascinating. Um, and the, the expertise you bring, uh, having lived in Beijing and Tokyo over the past two years uh, is, is fantastic. I wanna talk a little bit about both the Chinese and Japanese commitments to net zero China in 2060, Japan in 2050. Um, uh, the first question is uh, to, about Japan um, and why you think that Japan decided to make this announcement when it did before the election. Um, I personally was anticipating an announcement like this if Biden had won, but perhaps something a little more conservative had Trump had won in order to maintain that, that U.S.-Japan relationship. What does it mean that Japan uh, uh, made the announcement before the election? Does it just mean that the U.S. is no longer relevant in these conversations and that Japan needs to be making an announcement to sort of keep up with China and Europe? Uh, yes, no, I think it's a great question, and, and all of the timing of, of these announcements is very interesting, and I, I would say, again, in, in the case of China, I think it's quite clear. I think with Prime Minister Suga, uh, you know, he came in, this was one of his first, first speeches to the Diet. Uh, as I said, there's been a number of signs over, over the last year that Japan is moving in this direction anyway, um, especially under the leadership of the Minister of Environment, Kazumi. Um, so I think that there, there was pressure already from the European Union um, when China made its announcement, um, I had the feeling that, that Japan would have to respond uh, in, in some way or, or would feel like it needed to. Um, but again, I, I do think by doing it before the election, it, um, it signals that Japan is, is taking action and it, it already lays a, a foundation if a Biden admi administration comes in. Um, but I, I can't say for certain that that uh, is, is what they're um, intention was, um, but I do think that that either way, uh, if Trump um, if Trump stays in, in power then uh, or in office, then then Japan will obviously continue to be able to work on the initiatives uh, that it has been with the Trump administration. Again, LNG, uh, natural gas being a cleaner fuel than coal, uh, will be an important bridge fuel in the energy transition, and there's a lot to do there. Uh, there's a lot um, of other areas where that Japan and the US are working together in nuclear and also carbon capture that I think we would see continue. So I think to do it at this time, um, again, lays that, that foundation, but it also shows that the Japan is willing to step up and work with uh, the EU, which is another really important partner for them. Um, and it also gives them some grounds uh, to work with China as well, which is important given that they're both, uh, you know, uh, in East Asia uh, geographic neighbors um, and they need to find some common ground to work together. Yeah. Now, you, you touched on a question that, uh, that comes from uh, Jonathan Goh, 
uh, from uh, the Energy Market Authority in, in Singapore uh, on um, how Asia can work with the US on energy policy moving forward. You touched on Japan, but perhaps you can talk a little bit broader than that um, and, and what other Asian countries um, and can, can do to work with the US under both the Trump and a Biden, a potential Biden administration. Uh, yes, so I think that, like I said, the Asia Edge Initiative has been a, uh, has come um, about under the, the Trump administration as a part of our greater uh, free and open Indo-Pacific strategy. And to a certain extent, yes, that is a, um, a response to what China has been doing through the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, it's a, a way of saying that the US has other tools in our kit other than our security presence. We are also able to assist with uh, economic development and again, uh, want to provide opportunities not only for, for US companies in an in Asia market, but also to again, uh, assist these countries with uh, their economic development pathways. But I would say beyond that and, and those bilateral, um, that, that bilateral way of working together, there's also the potential to work in uh, multilateral forums like APEC um, and also in, in ASEAN and, and participating in, in those summits. Um, I think those are important areas where, uh, again, uh, Trump was not always uh, as present as, as they had hoped. Um, and that is something that I, I think a Biden administration would be, um, again, much more um, amenable to, to working with US allies in, in a more proactive way. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, should, should Trump uh, uh, stay in office, then hopefully that he would, he would also see the importance of working with, with US partners in Asia as well. Um, but I do think that those multilateral forums are, there was a lot under the Obama administration. I think there could be more under a Trump administration as well. Got it. So um, I've got a bunch of questions now in the in the chat, but also, but again, relevant for the entire group. So I just want to ask Maggie one more question to you before we open it up, um, and that is, you know, these these announcements by China, Japan, and Korea are are quite ambitious, but um, with uh, you know, despite some uh, some green shoots, pun intended here, um, that uh, you know, where you see opportunities for um, China, Japan, and Korea to to uh, Make their economies uh, more sustainable. Um, they still are heavily reliant on uh, fossil fuels, um, and particularly coal, as we as, as you've said. Um, though there is some coal to gas switching that we're seeing, which is uh, which is a positive. Um, but how real are these uh, these targets? How, are these more empty? Uh, are these are, are they going to put meat on the bones, or do you see them as sort of empty promises that uh, give them short term political wins? And um, if you think that they that they are real, what what do we need to see? What are the benchmarks? What are to to actually show that this is this is a real change and not just uh, not just sort of a, a, a sort of political posturing? Uh, yes. Yeah, so I do think that uh, to a certain extent there's political posturing, but I do think that they are all informed by research and models that show there is a pathway forward. Um, I think in terms of putting meat on the bones, uh, both China and Japan and Korea all have opportunities um, within the next year to show that this is serious. Um, in China's case, it's the development of the 14th five-year plan, which will be released in uh, 2021. Um, we should start seeing, um, again, so, so these five-year plans obviously happen every, every five years and they are an opportunity for uh, the Chinese government to lay out um, what really the direction of, of policy, and it's not just uh, just energy, obviously, um, over the next five years. And I think if we start to see, um, again, or more ambitious targets there, then we'll know that they're moving in the right direction. Uh, I will say that really, if you look at the models for China, it looks like renewable energy, higher penetration of renewable uh, energy, which is already starting in, in China, but is really not gonna take off to until 2030. But you might see other things like the rolling, they're rolling out the ETS this year. They are talking about expanding that into more sectors. So you might see, um, again, more details around uh, policies like that that are gonna shape the way forward. In Japan's case, it's the development of the strategic energy plan, uh, which they do every few years. Again, um, by next year, they'll be releasing a new one. I think it will be interesting to see if, if again, and they uh, revise the ambition for 2030, which is right now only at 26% uh, reduction uh, with I think it's 24% um, renewables in, in the power generation mix. Um, again, there, there still is this question on nuclear, which is supposed to make up uh, 22, uh, around 22% um, of, of power generation by um, 
for Japan. So I think there's some big questions there about the strategic energy plan under the um, under Prime Minister Suga uh, could uh, could show. Uh, in terms of Korea, I think we look like the EU at their Green New Deal, uh, which obviously is the Green New Deal as as we had uh, proposed in the U.S. as well. And and there's some significant. Uh, numbers that they've put forward. I think uh, it was originally $37 billion and they've increased that by another um, 7 billion in specific carbon cutting technologies. Again, I think as we see the, uh, the rollout of, of that deal, um, you'll start to see um, the serious steps that Korea will be taking. Wonderful. Um, I, I'm going to ask you one final question that then pivots to the whole group, and in particular, David Goldwyn. So David, you're, you're coming next. Um, but I, I have to assume that uh, in, in, in China, Japan, and Korea, that um, gas will play an important role in the short to medium term um, in, in uh, pushing out coal. Um, do, you, do you see that as, um, as sort of politically viable in each of those countries? And do you see the countries being willing to make, uh, make those changes to push out coal? Uh, yes, I do see it being uh, politically viable. I think uh, certainly in the case of, of Japan and Korea and, and also to a, a certain extent in China, I think the interesting thing about China's policies as you look in the, in the long term is it's clear that they're making also a play for, for energy security and a, and a decreased uh, reliance on, on foreign imports. Obviously, I think this is the goal of every country in terms of, of energy security, but I think China in particular understands uh, the vulnerabilities there and also has uh, the resources. Um, whereas Japan and Korea obviously have less uh, domestic resources and will continue to rely um, on, on partners like the US, Qatar uh, and Australia for, for their imports. Um, but yeah, I would say certainly that you will, you will see uh, LNG and natural gas playing a role uh, for decades to come. Fantastic, thank you. Now, uh, bringing in the whole group here, but I wanna go to David first because uh, we're talking about gas. Um, uh, US LNG uh, is what, 10% of the global LNG market right now, something like that. Um, and um, there are, of course, questions that have been raised about Biden's, uh, Biden's policy towards ex uh, LNG export and gas production in general. Now, if we see gas as an important part of decarbonizing major economies like Japan, uh, uh, China, and Korea, um, how, how does that argument play out in the United States versus the sort of international need for gas to push out coal versus the domestic push uh, to stop hydrocarbon production uh, in, in the US? Sure, I think it's gonna be a tricky issue on the Democratic side. And certainly during the campaign, um, there have been uh, divisions, I think, between those on the progressive wing of the party who see um, uh, gas not as a bridge fuel, but as another hydrocarbon um, to be phased out. And those in the more moderate wing, which see it plays a role in backing up renewables, it has industrial purposes, and, um, and plays a role in the energy transition. So I think that's going to get fought out in the administration. I think a couple of things are going to temper a Biden approach to, to natural gas. One is that coal is still the dominant fuel, particularly in Asia and in the high emitting countries. Second is that you're going to have to provide an affordable alternative to coal if you're going to provide uh, an ability to have change at a very large scale. And third, while John talked about the progress there is in batteries um, and the cost curves are coming down, um, you're talking about the cost of the, the burden of transition. I think the theology of the Paris Agreement is that um, you respect countries' nationally determined commitments as long as they're credible and verifiable. And if gas plays a role in the NDCs of major economies across the world, then I think the U.S. is going to respect that. Uh, and not tell them that they have to dictate their NDCs in a particular way, because that's not the way the Paris Agreement is supposed to work. So as long as those are credible commitments and gas plays a role, I think the U.S. will be comfortable, or can get itself to a place where it will be comfortable, um, in exporting gas and accepting its role in the energy transition. Very hard conversation to have before the election. But after the election, I think that is not only um, a, um, a sort of a technology reality um, and a commercial reality, um, but it's also going to be a diplomatic reality as well. And, and if you note, um, I think Vice President Biden has been careful to say that he is not banning fracking. Uh, he has said nothing about uh, restricting exports. What we will have in the U.S. is a test for new infrastructure, infrastructure not already permitted, which is if we're going to have a new LNG export terminal or a new pipeline, it is going to have to show that it fits with the NDC, that it meets environmental justice criteria, 
and that you calculate the direct, indirect, and cumulative emissions resulting from that, and they will either need to be offset in some way or otherwise harmonious with the, with the NDC. So, um, so I think that's how a Biden administration could, and I would add probably should, square the circle uh, on natural gas. But I'd be curious. I mean, John, uh, John Morton has a, you know, has a view on this as well and, and, and sees different parts of it, whether, whether he thinks that would be a sound approach. Yeah, John, I'd love to hear from you on this. Um, look, I think that's a sound approach, and I think it's probably the most likely uh, path forward, uh, David. Um, you know, uh, I, 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 if I were drafting the policy, I might, I might want it to be a slightly more kind of ambitious and uh, from a from a carbon and climate perspective. But I think you've outlined what is a what is a likely um, what is a likely outcome. So I don't, I, I, I agree with what I agree with your position there. So, John, you raised something earlier uh, about uh, U.S. methane uh, 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 venting, flaring, fugitive emissions, um, and the the deal uh, that was blocked by by the French government just last week. Um, Angie was supposed to buy uh, uh, take a, a big offtake agreement with what a, a next next generation uh, proposed uh, uh, plant. Um, how does methane regulation uh, in the U.S. play a role? in the competitiveness of future US LNG exports in this in a world that's looking to uh, minimize uh, emissions. Maybe Andrea, you can take that first. Um, so on the issue of um, US methane emissions, so we've talked a little bit about how um, Bi the Biden campaign has been very clear that this is something that uh, they're going to take very seriously. Um, we've seen under Trump how we've seen this regulation roll back. Uh, the Biden team has been very clear that they want to move forward uh, with regulation of existing and new sources of uh, methane. Um, so I think that a key question here will be, um, how quickly does that actually become effective? Um, so we talked about how the regulatory process is a very long-term process. This can take years uh, to work through um, the regulation and then potentially through the courts as well as we saw under Obama. So how quickly does that potentially become effective? And then what does that signal to buyers potentially of US LNG overseas um, in terms of, is this real? Is it serious? Is it actually going to be implemented and be effective? And are we going to see real changes in that emissions portfolio from the United States um, coming down the pipeline, so to speak, in a meaningful way that fits with what they want to see from the sources of LNG that they are buying? Um, there's this other question of, can US LNG suppliers potentially uh, differentiate themselves in some meaningful way um, or will the United States be taken as a whole because some areas of production, such as the Permian, tend to be um, higher emission and where there tends to be maybe, uh, for lack of a better term, um, less strident governance on this issue. Um, so is there a way to differentiate yourself? Um, we're seeing that next decade uh, with the energy situation is maybe finding that a bit difficult. Uh, so there's a, a number of open questions here, and it seems like there's going to be some significant negotiation and some really hard discussions on this topic going forward. And it may be that, um, there, that this takes a bit of time to really work through. Got it. Um, what is what role do we do uh, state level regulators, in particular? I'm thinking of the Texas Railroad Commission, play in in this as well. Um, Andrea, David. Sure. Well, I, the um, they play a, a critical role. Um, yeah, they set the rules on how much flaring is permitted. They grant the air permits and exceptions. Um, Texas Railroad Commission has never denied uh, a request for a waiver from uh, from emissions. Um, but um, this is very much an issue in the, in the um, election of new Texas Railroad Commissioner right now. Um, I think um, since their primary uh, responsibility of state commissioners is preservation of the assets, um, I think it's going to be an increasing, an increasing factor. Um, the other aspect is that, uh, you know, in Texas, you've seen cases where there has been unused pipeline capacity, and yet they still grant a producer, um, you know, a, a waiver. And so, you know that may um, that may that may change as well, um, and that's an area where the you you'll see um, the commercial competition. You will see that producers will try and differentiate themselves. You know I think Pioneer says they they they're not going to produce hydrocarbons unless there's takeaway capacity. So um, 
so I think the um, in North Dakota and Texas where there's significant amounts of flaring, it's their responsibility, but today there is no pressure on them, essentially no cost. And this is what will change under a Biden administration is there can be tighter enforcement through EPA of emissions rules. Um, and if there's legislation, of course, there will be absolute prohibitions, but even not, there will still be a significant pressure um, but without that, um, while they have the responsibility, they're not doing, not taking the actions. Got it. John, um, the EU has recently released uh, guidance or sort of initial document on its methane strategy. And it appears uh, from first glance that their approach will be to look at methane uh, from a country level. As, as Andrea suggested, there are two approaches. There's the sort of country, sort of broad brush, uh, the country level and then the um, uh, looking at individual suppliers. Um, do you, you know, you, you were in Europe uh, until I guess June, July, the, recently, you were, you were in Europe for the past couple of years. Do you have any sense of what, um, what the thinking is behind that um, and how that might impact the decision-making of US companies that are, are working on, you know, working on trying to reduce their methane versus those that are, um, are, are frankly not? Yeah, Randy, I mean, I have I have I have opinions, but I, they're 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 opinions, and they're not you know. They're, I think that these are all issues that are kind of underway and being 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 worked out as as we as we speak. I mean, I guess what I would, let me so let me come back to that. I would I would just start from the question going back to the question that you asked uh, uh, two two questions ago on methane in the in the U.S. Um, uh, I think that. Um, Methane is very clearly the most the most kind of damaging and dangerous greenhouse gas. Uh, if you start again from the notion that there is a uh, that there is a coming kind of global consensus of the need for strong and effective action against climate change globally, um, you have to think about what the reaction will be not simply from the U.S. government's own posture, but what what the reaction will be from other countries looking in at the U.S. products that are produced in high emitting ways, right? With methane being the simplest, frankly, to abate in many ways, simplest to abate, um, and which is why the Obama administration was so pleased when it when we ran the analysis that showed that not only can this be done uh, very quickly, it can be done extremely cost effectively, right? With, with captured methane being, uh, or with, with uh, non-emitted methane being, you know, uh, uh, essentially saved and, and, and you know, made, makes, makes, uh, makes oil and gas operations more efficient. Um, so actually, I don't. I don't believe that it, it is going to be a major um, burden on industry. I think the the Biden will move quickly on this. I think industry will adjust quickly. And I'll just say this: I think in the past we've seen, with respect to methane, we've seen industry kind of hedging, because it knows that it had it knows that it had uh, the ability to play administrations off of one another, and there were still kind of uh, points of disagreement within the U.S. I don't think we're going to have another national election where the issue of methane emissions is going to be contested going forward. Um, I, I think that we are assuming Biden wins in this election. In other words, I think the issue of methane will be resolved in the next four years because it is such a clear and present danger to the climate and such a convincing economic case for why uh, uh, um, uh, capturing that that uh, you know those fugitive emissions is is so important. So that's 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 point number one. With respect to how um, the methane is uh, kind of accounted for and 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 um, and regulated at the at the industry or country level, I think that's very much a work in progress. And of course, the EU is famously um, uh, um, famously Waiting good and bad. Here. Waiting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Famously long-winded in trying to figure out those issues of national versus industrial and, uh, issues. So we'll have to see what happens there, I guess. Is, and to, to use a Trump line, we'll have to see what happens, right? Uh, he's eternally changed our lexicon. Uh, Maggie, I want to turn to you on this question. You know, the, the Europeans have been driving a lot of the conversation about, uh, about methane. Do you, do you see uh, any concern about methane from Japan or China? Was that a conversation that was happening while you were there or is just getting gas sort of good enough at this point? Yeah, I would say, um, I mean, meth methane is certainly a, a concern. I mean, as, as uh, David Andrew and, and John have, have talked about, I mean, as it's a, a, a quite potent greenhouse um, 
gas. However, I think that the question in, in an Asian context is, is more about the price and the competitive of, of U.S. gas and, um, again, the opportunity for market development. Um, it's one thing to talk about gas, again, in the East Asia context. It's a different thing to talk about the gas market in the developing context of, of Southeast Asia um, and the rest of, of the Indo-Pacific. And so I think that the Southeast Asia question is, is quite interesting because what you've seen is um, the Japanese and, and, again, to a certain extent, uh, U.S. companies as well, uh, looking at how to, to, again, develop this, this market because it's in both of our, our interests. Um, Japan, is a, as an importer, obviously has a lot of um, expertise in building out um, the, the up, uh, downstream infrastructure, whereas the U.S. has the upstream expertise and obviously um, is, is the major exporter. So I think that question might be uh, interesting uh, to discuss is if there is a change in administration, will, will there still be um, again, this uh, momentum behind uh, pushing U.S. Uh, LNG over to uh, uh, Asia partners, number one. And number two, if there's a greater emphasis on climate change and climate action and um, more emphasis on renewable energy development as well or other emerging technologies, um, what will that look like? Um, again, coming from the U.S. and looking at overseas investment. And in my mind, it, it might be, uh, you know, LNG development uh, coupled with more carbon capture uh, or things like that. Again, as we're starting to see Southeast Asian countries um, be more confident in the ability to um, leapfrog uh, a, a, and move beyond fossil fuels moving forward. Okay, we've got a bunch of good questions from the audience. Um, I, I have the opportunity to ask you questions basically anytime I want. Um, and the audience does, doesn't necessarily do that. So let me, let me go to them. There are two questions that are in a group together and they're about the election and energy policy. So I'll go to David and Andrea first. Um, from Karina Chu, um, how politically damaging were Biden's comments about closing down the oil industry? Um, and, uh, and then another question, a related question from Kylie Chin, what does the election outcome mean for the oil industry? Um, I f and so, uh, yeah, David and, and Andrea, love to hear from you on that. And did we just lose uh, uh, John? Did he end up falling out? He's just well, Place down, John. Let me. Well, uh, let me go. Well, we're waiting for John to. Maybe he lost his internet. But David and Andrea, why don't you? That's too bad. I have a really great question for him. Let's hope he comes back. Um, okay. So David and Andrea. Sure. Well, let me let me start with the question of the uh, the impact on uh, of Biden's statements. I don't think that these were um, materially damaging uh, to the vice president. First, you know, he he made clear quickly immediately after the debate and statements he made the next morning that. What he what he meant is that um, the plans that he has put forward, um, which are net zero by 2050 and zero power emissions by uh, 2035, you know, all mean that there is going to be a, a change in the the use of oil uh, as you move to electric vehicles, um, promoting electric vehicles, electric charging stations. We're going to use less oil, and so um, so that's a long term transition. We're going to be using hydrocarbons for a long time. So I think he he clarified what he meant, which was not really not not really making news, not different from you know, from the peak demand uh, kind of conversations that people are having more broadly. But I think also politically, it doesn't really hurt him. Um, and to the extent that progressives have been wondering whether Biden is strong enough uh, on his commitment to uh, 2050, you know, uh, I think that kind of reinforced them. In the red states like, um, you know, like Oklahoma and North Dakota, um, you know, people who are in the, in the oil and gas business weren't going to vote for him anyway. Um, and so, you know, that didn't really hurt. Um, and so there were really no surprises there. Um, Texas is close. It's a toss up state according to Charlie Cook this morning, which is stunning, but that's not coming from the conversion of oil and gas supporters you know, to, to Biden. This is coming from you know, different constituencies. So I think not, not a big problem. You know, in terms of the oil industry overall, um, uh, let Andrea come in on that one. I think um, uh, you know, there's, there's changes in, in the, the regulatory business and how they do business, but um, I think they're, they're manageable. Andrea, why don't you take that one? Um, yeah, I was, I was going to say that I um, definitely concur with those comments. And 
uh, it really needs to be um, emphasized, and we've talked about this a little bit in the conversation so far, this election is not about climate change. Um, for the vast majority of Americans, climate change very much remains a peripheral issue. Um, so even though we're seeing a great deal of momentum on this, um, particularly in electorates in other regions like Europe, um, at the end of the day in the United States, the top issues for this election are coronavirus and the economy. Um, those are the day-to-day -day things that are really driving how Americans are thinking right now. Um, so certainly there are a growing number of Americans who do care deeply about the environment and climate-related issues, um, but that's not going to be the reason uh, that Joe Biden wins or does not win the election. Um, in terms of, you know, how the oil industry is thinking about Joe Biden and how um, they might consider approaching his term, at the end of the day, um, the oil industry, not just to the United States, but worldwide, is coming to terms with the reality of climate change. Um, thinking about climate change, thinking about what do their business models look like in a world that is dealing with climate change. Um, we're seeing this all over Europe. Uh, we've seen Total, BP, Shell, Equinor. Uh, we're seeing these companies really thinking hard about this. And we know that in the United States, there are some hard questions being asked um, of American companies in this space as well. Um, we're seeing some companies um, in in the midstream, in the downstream, for example, um, who are talking about their own emissions reductions targets, talking about their own net zero strategies. Um, so there definitely seems to be the sense that uh, a Biden victory is not necessarily um, the end of the world, you know, so to speak, for the oil and gas industry. And frankly, everyone is aware, as David mentioned, we're going to be using hydrocarbons for a good deal longer in any energy transition scenario. Um, but there is some real strategic thinking, thinking probably happening um, throughout the country, um, probably particularly um, in Texas right now, about what that future is going to look like and how do you manage and, ev and evolve the business accordingly. Um, so certainly some hard questions are being asked, um, but the, at the end of the day, everyone understands that we're talking about um, the long haul, so to speak. Randy, if I could, just two other quick points in addition to Andrea's excellent points. I think one is that we're seeing consolidation in the U.S. oil patch right now. And so the major companies, you know, are all beyond, as John pointed out, they all understand that they've got to control methane um, and, and will take steps to do it. And they have, in fact, called for regulation two years ago of new and existing sources. It's in the independent sector, which is getting bought up that you have thinner margins and, you know, and that's where you're getting the resistance. So I think um, they're going to be unhappy. Um, but I think you're going to have more consolidation and that won't be a problem. The other thing I think that the, uh, you know, the energy sector is looking at um, is that you're going to have much less volatile trade relations under a Biden administration. You're not going to have a Biden administration cheerleading for, for hydrocarbon exports. That's not what they're, they're going to do. But you're also not going to have this kind of gratuitous tariff war uh, with other countries. You're going to see a return of diplomacy, including trade diplomacy. And frankly, the, the, the Trump trade policy has been catastrophic you know, for the U.S. hydrocarbon industry because it is shut off, you know, LNG because of retaliatory tariffs shut off LNG exports to China and oil exports to China, which is the largest growing market. So, you know, I think they're going to have to do business differently um, and there will be more consolidation. But I think, um, you know, it may, may, you know, they may, they may, they may, they will not look back on the Trump days with nostalgia. You know, I, I was given a briefing uh, earlier this week on um, a new uh, methane monitoring platform, um, and uh, they were showing showing me uh, the Permian, and you know it had the in, in this one area of the Permian, it was the top five, so best performing uh, regarding methane, so lowest lowest emissions, and then the bottom five, and the top five were all names that we've all heard of, and the bottom five were names that I had never heard of. Um, and so really, David, it, the point is really well taken that it really is the, the independents who have been uh, resisting uh, the, the methane regulations because they really are, are, are underperforming. Um, and so the, the, um, uh, the consolidation that's happening right now might actually um, help methane, even if Europe takes a countrywide approach to, uh, to its methane, uh, methane regulations, methane policy, U.S. might get better simply because of this consolidation. Uh, remains to be seen, but it's a, but it's interesting. So, John, welcome back. Um, you know, one of the one of the benefits of virtual platforms is that we can be anywhere in the world at any time. Uh, you, the the benefit of being in person is that it's very hard to disappear uh, all of a sudden. Though I've seen it happen. Um, 
somebody just just decides they're no longer speaking and runs away. Okay, but we have a great question from the audience for you from uh, Sandy Gui. Um, she says, between corporate America and government intervention, if you had to pick, which would be more essential for uh, pushing the energy transition in the United States? Now, I know you want both, but if you had to choose either corporate America leading or the USG leading, which would it be? I can't say both. She's putting me in a bind. Um, can't say both. Look, look, here's the Not deal. If you, if you uh, obviously, um, if we if we had a government policy that was uh, enforceable and uh, and um, you know um, and adopted widely, for example, around carbon pricing. Right. And there are very smart people on both sides of the aisle who realize that the future will have to involve, and as I said in my remarks, already does involve carbon pricing at the national, subnational, corporate level. If we had that type of framework at the national level, that would undeniably be the biggest single forcing event for climate action that we could have. And I believe we will get there, but it's a question of how long and when. So, so in the absence of, of having that kind of tool right now, um, I actually think that, you know, uh, con coordinated corporate efforts, um, particularly from the financial sector, um, which it, we're beginning to see now, will be incredibly powerful in the, uh, in the next five years. Uh, because as I said before, you know, it, it, it's, the, it's financial markets that determine how capital is allocated, you know, the price of the price of lending, the price of the price of equity, the, uh, and and historically, uh, financial markets have have um, treated carbon as a uh, as an unpriced uh, externality, right? And and with all of the with all of the uh, uh, with all of the impacts that come from that, that is changing, right? We're seeing that change in Europe. We're seeing the head of the IMF call for that to change. We're seeing the head of the European Central Bank call for that to change. Um, and when that changes, financial markets will move extremely quickly and in herd mentality. You're not going to be the last. You're not going to want to be the last one standing on a high-intensity uh, carbon uh, portfolio. You're just not going to want to hold those assets, um, and that's going to occur in historical terms overnight, right? That's going to occur in historical terms in a very, very short period of time. So, what I would like to see is I'd love to see financial markets um, take a far more, as they are beginning to do now. Uh, aggressive posture on carbon as a risk to the economy, as Europe has said it is, and as Trump's own CFTC has recently said. Uh, if that were to occur and we begin to price in carbon at risk as, as what it is, a, a threat to the long-term viability of the, of the economy, the global economy, um, we will see things move extremely, extremely quickly. Uh, John, you know, a, a friend um, uh, at another at, a, at another bank, not at BlackRock, was telling me um, after Larry Fink's announcement earlier this year, sort of all of all of Wall Street sort of looked up, surprised, took a deep breath, and turned ninety degrees, um, and sort of said, "Okay, this is the way. This is the future." We sort of thought it was coming, and now it, now it's now it's here. Um, yeah. David wanted to jump in, and then we've got another great question for uh, for all the panelists. Sure. Thanks, Randy. No, I think I, I, I agree with John in the sense that you, uh, that you need both. Um, and here in the United States, I think certainly corporate leadership um, and just better competition um, can make huge changes in the, in the way our energy economy works. But globally, I think you need governments. I really think uh, particularly in the governments where you know, they're dominated by state-owned enterprises um, or where you have large national champions, moving that existing infrastructure uh, that coal infrastructure, which has a 30 year life out, switching from coal to lower carbon fuels, pricing, elimination of subsidies, so that you have a financial incentive for energy efficiency, all that's gonna require uh, policy. I don't see how we get to two degrees, much less one and a half degrees without government stepping in worldwide in a big way. I think um, uh, industry can lower the burden and, and cost of adjustment, um, but without government policy, this is gonna take us a whole lot longer, I think. Thank you, David, and thank you, John. Okay, um, question from Dora Law, um, and so, and she asks all the panelists, so we want to hear from everybody. Um, Biden aims to push as much as $1.7 trillion over 10 years into a plan to boost renewable power. Simply, do you think this is viable? Uh, Maggie, why don't we start with you? 
Sorry, I had to unmute for a second. Um, so there's definitely uh, questions about, yeah, the, the viability of, of renewables and the, the concerns about uh, the variability. And, and David already had, had brought up, there's uh, still limitations with battery storage, even though we're seeing um, advancements happen very quickly. Um, but I do think that we will uh, will see a dramatic expansion of, of renewables as, as we already have. Um, and again, that's going to require a significant uh, investment and in also our grid infrastructure, which Biden has also talked about um, investing in. Um, so I do think that there is a viable path forward, especially as you see uh, the projections for the um, of rates of electrification. Um, that electrification will uh, require uh, large amounts of uh, renewable energy, also uh, electric vehicles that will be integrated into the, the system that will potentially be able to help with stability uh, of the grid. And I think as we start to see these different factors come together, um, then um, we're gonna be able to see how, how this actually will, will turn out. Um, but to, to David and Andrea's point earlier, I think we will continue to, to see gas as a base load source um, until batteries can really um, uh, have a longer uh, um, longer time than than four hours, which we're really seeing right now. Um, so I guess that's a few comments. I'm sure someone will pick up from here. Great, David. Yeah, I was going to actually defer to, to Andrew in this. I think I think I think it's a misstatement to say that it's 1.7 trillion in renewable energy. It's that's a much larger plan, but uh, but Andrew. Yeah, that's. <laughs> Let me yeah, I'm, I'm happy uh, to jump in on that. Um, so I believe that in the Build Back Better plan, which is the latest iteration, or so I guess addendum, so to speak, uh, to the existing Biden climate energy platform proposals, um, there is a call for a $2 trillion accelerated investment um, broadly geared towards uh, basically economy-wide emissions reductions and energy system transformation. So absolutely, um, that certainly means renewables. It's going to mean wind, solar, um, offshore wind, battery storage, all of that, electrification for sure. But the Biden team understands that we don't have a, just a power generation problem. Um, if we're really going to get to net zero, we've got to deal with industrial emissions, transportation emissions, buildings, these really tough, challenging sectors where it is much more difficult to pull emissions out of. So the Biden team has been very clear that they're open to all of the options. Um, so, for example, the uh, carbon-free pollution of, from the power sector pledge um, is technology neutral. Um, so that's leaving the door open for a lot of options. Um, the Biden team has also been clear that they're open to carbon capture of various types. They're open to um, hydrogen and hydrogen applications, open to technologies that we don't even know about yet. Um, so it's very much um, a broad-based plan that allows for everyone to come to the table with their, um, their technology, their policy option, their solution that's going to help us pull these emissions um, from all of these sectors, not just power generation, that are going to be really critical to begin to solve the puzzle of how does the U.S. actually get to net zero in a realistic way. I just add there a couple of more things that are in that plan. It's also emissions from agriculture, so there's incentives for uh, for, for sequestering of emissions and uh, and carbon in, in agriculture, reforestation, transmission is a huge part of it. You know, building a grid, we have a lot of excess renewable energy in places, um, and we have um, a, a power shortages in places like California. By having a more of a national grid, we don't have one right now, and building that out that does require government investment. And that would allow for increased um, the capacity utilization in renewable energy as well as, as growth. There's also money for workforce development to train the workforce of the future and for um, environmental justice, which includes easing the burden of adjustment for those like in coal communities you know, who would suffer as well. So it's not all about renewables. It's really, I think, as Andrea said, about the whole system transformation. Randy, could I just could I just jump in and just, just go back very briefly to, to, to one of the statistics I gave earlier? I mean, I, I think, you know, it is worth reflecting on the fact that even in this administration, we've seen almost three quarters of our new energy installation capacity each of the last two years be renewables. Uh, and that's at a period as we continue to see the costs of those technologies come down. And as we continue to see battery technology get better and the costs come down, you know, extremely quickly. So I don't think it is, uh, I don't think those numbers are, are, are hard to imagine. I don't think they're extraordinary. I think we are already seeing this transition occur despite an administration that is very unfriendly toward these, uh, toward these technologies. And so, uh, you know, 
let's let's just recognize where we are now already under an administration that is not very friendly toward these uh, toward these technologies and imagine where we will be under administration that not only is friendly toward them but is making it a centerpiece of his uh, industrial and economic revitalization uh, 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 strategy for the country. Um, I just think it's it's worth putting that in context because we're, we're, we're already seeing tremendous investment here and that's against significant headwinds. Imagine what happens when those when the, when you have tailwinds uh, behind you. John, do you think that that amount of money is is really feasible? Um, yes. In, yes. E I even mean, if the Democrats don't take back the Senate, um, it just traditionally when Republicans are out of power, they are much much more uh, hawkish on the deficit than when they are in power. Do you see a Republican Senate uh, providing that amount of money for? clean energy and sort of the energy end of green transition in the United States economy. I have to, it's very hard for me not to make a comment, uh, reflect on what you just said, but it is true that Democrats generally end up cleaning up a bit of a mess uh, um, uh, uh, when they when they come into office, certainly in the last couple of administrations and are forced to deal with a Republican Congress that has refound its interest in fiscal discipline. And I imagine the same will be true here if Biden wins. Um, which is an Let's unfortunate clear, the situation. Council is a nonpartisan organization. This is an analytical point backed up by data. By, by strong data, by strong data going back at least until, in, until the 1980s uh, and, and likely be before that. Um, uh, look, you have interest rates near zero right now. There are, I, I spend a lot of time in my, in my day job working, uh, working with and advising uh, uh, asset, uh, asset owners and asset managers and, and, and private equity funds, et cetera. Um, there is, uh, there is, uh, the, the markets right now are awash in capital looking for places to deploy it. Um, European pension funds uh, are looking at, 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 at historically low uh, <laughs> rates of return from their investment, from their traditional investment sectors. Um, the, US, uh, in, in the US market for renewable energy, um, you know, while margins have compressed in recent years as, as the market has gotten more competitive, still produce yields that are very, very attractive to many institutional investors. So whether or not the US uh, government chooses under a, a, a Trump two administration to provide more uh, public support for this, uh, for, these, for this build out, the US has incredible natural resources when it comes to solar and wind, also geothermal, and that will, those will attract capital in the way that um, we've already seen over the last several years. So yes, it would be better, I think, if the U.S. government applies its public resources to kind of kickstart that, um, you know, th those those industries and that regrowth and rebuilding that I mentioned in my remarks. But I think the capital will flow. It, uh, you know, uh, will find will find a way to invest in the same way that it has over the over the last several years. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to do one last question uh, from the audience. Um, it would not be an Atlanta Council event if we didn't somehow bring Nord Stream two into the conversation. Um, so <laughs> um, it's broader than Nord Stream 2, but I do hope Nord Stream 2 is part of the answer. Um, so, uh, and, and again, this is a question to all the panelists. So anybody's uh, uh, welcome to answer. Um, would U.S. come from Hayden Lee? Um, would U.S. policy towards Russia change if President Trump is reelected or if Joe Biden is reelected? Um, so, how, so how does how does U.S. policy towards Russia look in uh, both the Trump and a Biden administration, um, and and let's let's try to focus on energy so that we, so that we can talk about Nord Stream two. And I saw Andrea take herself off mute, so I'm going to go to her first. <laughs> um, Sorry. Certainly. Um, so I'll just I'll be very brief there, um, and I'm sure David uh, would love to come in on this as well. Um, so we know that uh, the former vice president is on the record as um, being. Um, having a very grim, dim view of Vladimir Putin, and uh, he's very not supportive of the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. We've seen under the Trump administration how the, um, the administration has taken a pretty hard stance on this and really done everything it can think of, particularly in terms of sanctions, uh, to stop the pipeline. Um, we don't necessarily see that that would change dramatically under a Biden administration, 
um, in terms of what the relationship looks like going forward, um, certainly much more adversarial. And certainly we think a Biden administration is going to be much less um, willing to countenance um, Russian anti-democratic activity and efforts to use um, energy, particularly natural gas and pipelines, to attempt to manipulate um, their neighbors and to try to have um, a chokehold over um, the energy systems in their neighborhood. Um, so certainly um, we can expect to see a great deal less um, tolerance of that. So in some senses, you could see a continuation um, potentially um, with respect to Nord Stream 2 specifically from the Trump administration, but in terms of the general relationship, um, considerably um, less cordial, to put it that way. Yeah, Randy, if I can jump in on this one. Yeah, I think that's right. Relationship with Russia is going to be extremely fraught, whether it's a Trump administration or a Biden administration. If it's the Trump administration, then you're going to have Congress step forward, particularly people, uh, Republicans running for, uh, for the president in the next cycle, um, and those who are just concerned with Russia, drive, as they have in the past four years, congressionally mandated sanctions and push for enforcement on Russia because of its action it's near abroad, because of cyber terrorism, because of interference with the elections. Under a Biden administration, I think you're going to see the same as well. But keep in mind um, that you'll have a bit of a return to diplomacy. The, the Biden's concern will be interference with our elections. The point about Nord Stream 2 is not about we'd like a particular pipeline. It's about the impact on Ukraine and its economy and its survivability as a nation. Um, and the response to Crimea. So, you know, I, I would not rule out as impossible, you know, a more coordinated, effective, um, uh, uh, and uh, enforceable policy with respect to containing uh, Russians' aggrandizement, um, you know, which might have space for some flexibility on, on Nord Stream 2. But I think the initial position is, uh, you know, is as it has been for 30 years, um, you know, to, uh, to avoid more Russian pipelines that increase uh, Europe's dependency on Russia. Right. Do, do you think that with the Biden, in the Biden administration, with the effort to uh, mend relations in Europe, that will change specifically the approach, uh, the, the very aggressive approach to Nord Stream 2 that, uh, that has angered the Germans and many others? I think it's possible, but, um, you know, you know, we had this with Iran, you know, I think 20 years ago, we called it, you know, sort of the critical dialogue where we'd impose sanctions on European companies for or their things, and we replace that with you know sort of a more coordinated, effective policy. Um, although some people argue the dialogue was neither critical nor much of a dialogue. Um, so in the event that we get a you know we talk to to Europe and we have a tighter, tougher, and enforceable policy, which is better than the one that we've got, and has more solid European enforcement, I think a Biden administration would listen to what Chancellor Merkel and others have to say about Nord Stream Two. Um, but it's not a chit just to be traded away. I mean, I think it is part of a greater package. I think they would listen. If we end up with something which is much better, which makes Europe less dependent, Ukraine stronger, um, and maybe leads to um, a more competitive European gas market so that we can, uh, we can ensure that accessibility, um, you know, I think that's a conversation that a Biden administration would need to listen to. Got it. John or Maggie, either of you want to chime in on this? Then what I'd like to do is just give each of you 30 seconds to a minute to make any final comments or add any final thoughts, uh, and then we will close this out. So why don't we start with John? Well, thanks, and thanks for the opportunity to, to be with you today. Really, uh, really enjoyed the conversation. Um, I think I'll just you know summarize my I guess my main my main perspectives here, which is that we are um, on a on a direction of of economic transformation that has um, has made itself very clear uh, over the last um, you know five to ten years and I think we've seen um, a, a extremely strong indications in the last month that um, we are going to continue down this transition and redouble we the global community is redoubling its commitment to to um, to, uh, to transitioning to a lower carbon footprint um, and I think the real question for you know for the next administration whoever it will be, is whether we're going to uh, um, hear those signals and how we're going to react to those. And I think you've seen on one case, a candidate who continues, who, who, who uh, in President Trump, who, who has made no indication that he is hearing those and reading those signals. And in the case of Joe Biden has, has really um, uh, not only heard the signals, but made, made this, um, uh, this, this transition uh, 
uh, and, and climate a, a centerpiece of his rebuilding plan. So you have a very stark difference uh, in terms of the two candidates. Um, and I, you know, obviously from a climate perspective, from a global climate perspective, I think there's a very preferred, you know, preferred option here uh, in terms of the type of U.S. engagement that you'd likely to, that you'd likely see. So I appreciate the opportunity. And Randy, back to you. Fantastic. Thanks, John. Uh, Maggie, next. Yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. This has been such an interesting conversation. And um, again, just to, to follow up with, with what John said, um, it's clear that the world is moving in um, a direction um, that I hope the US will, will follow, um, despite uh, what happens with the outcome of the election. Uh, if Biden um, comes into office, then I think there's a great opportunity for the US to start taking steps um, again, to, to lead in the climate space. I know that will take time. I just want to remind um, our partners, um, as we as we discussed, that at the subnational level and, and our corporations across the United States, there's a lot of momentum for climate change. And I think, again, um, given what uh, the number of states that are on board represent as a, as a total of US GDP, that means you have, a, again, a a lot of <clears throat> excuse me, momentum behind climate action, despite what happens. Um, and I do hope to see the US stepping uh, into a, a more ambitious role um, on par with the EU uh, and now China, Japan, and Korea. Wonderful, thank you, Maggie. Uh, Andrea. Okay. Um, so uh, continuing on with um, that theme, just to kind of close out some of we've, what we've talked about today, um, the central conclusion David and I came to both in January and in August in the uh, iterations of our analysis of this is that volatility is ahead regardless of who's going to win this election. Um, so I think that the central theme here is going to be buckle up um, regardless of what happens. And um, I wanted to make the point too, since we haven't gone into this too much, um, that is particularly true, if not more so, in a Biden scenario, even though we seem to have a pretty good idea of what he would like to do, it does need to be remembered that there is considerable intra-party division among Democrats about exactly how they want to move forward on climate and energy. So there are some very tough negotiations ahead, very tough discussions, not really sure how far past November 3rd that party unity will last if indeed Biden does win. Um, so be on the lookout for those developments and where things might go on that front. Thank you so much. And last but not least, David. Great, thanks Randy. And, and thanks to uh, Singapore uh, International Energy Week for, you know, for having us. It's always a high level and really terrific discussion. Um, I, I think if, if President Trump is reelected, um, you're gonna see a continuation of this personalistic diplomacy. It's very hard to predict what will happen, um, but I think there will be um, continued progress uh, in the clean energy world from, uh, from the commercial point of view. Um, and leadership will go elsewhere. Um, and as Andrea pointed out, we worry about the geopolitical volatility. I think I would want to reassure, um, you know, our friends in Asia that if, uh, if Vice President Biden becomes president, you're going to see a return of American diplomacy. You're going to see a recognition of the importance of, uh, of dealing with China as a competitor and not making sure, not turning it into an adversary. You're going to see the importance of uh, a recognition of the importance of trade. Um, both in clean energy and other spaces with all of our Asian partners you know, as a way of building a tighter um, community which respects the rule of law and an international trading system. And I think you're going to see a return of a higher level of, uh, of competency, um, both in terms of scientists and in terms of diplomats and in terms of bureaucratic leadership that will, that will, um, you know, that will change the way America leads in the world. I think a Biden team knows that in the climate space, if they want to lead abroad, they have to lead at home first. So we're going to get our own house in order. And that's really, it'll be harder uh, if uh, Democrats don't take the Senate, but they're going to do it either way. And once they get their own house in order, you'll see the U.S. return to the table, I think, in a huge way with appointment of names that the world will recognize to try and lead both at home and abroad on that space. Um, and then uh, and then we will be able to, to rejoin that mainstream trend towards uh, the energy transition. Um, which we were leading not so long ago. Thank you, David. Um, thank you, uh, all the panelists, uh, uh, Andrea, uh, Maggie, John. Really, really appreciate your insights today. Um, thank you to Singapore International Energy Week. We always love uh, being part of this conversation. Hope to be back in Singapore next year. Let's hope uh, the world is back somewhat to normal. Um, thank you to our friends at the Singapore Energy Market Authority. Always a pleasure to work with you.
Um, if, and, and thank you to the audience uh, for joining and for your great questions. Um, if you are interested in uh, the Atlanta Council's coverage of the US election on energy and beyond, you can look at uh, the Atlanta Council website. We have a page dedicated to election related issues. Um, remember that uh, David and Andrea have written a great paper on what the election means for US energy policy. Um, they published uh, a first version of that in January and then an update in August once uh, Biden was confirmed as the nominee. And I think that's very, very helpful uh, for understanding what, uh, what the outcome uh, in either way will look like. Um, Again, uh, the Atlanta Council is a nonpartisan organization. I need to uh, remind everyone of that, uh, given where I think some of us stand on these issues, uh, but we are very data-driven and um, the data does point towards uh, the necessity for climate action. Um, so uh, on that, uh, please, uh, please continue to watch this space. Um, visit us at the Atlanta Council website and you can join our Atlanta Council events. Um, and you know, if, if the election is not over on Tuesday, which I suspect it won't be, uh, I suspect we'll have some ballot counting over the, the following few days, uh, you can continue to look at the Atlanta Council's website for commentary on what's going on. Um, thank you all so much and hope to see you again virtually uh, soon and in person in Singapore next year.